curious about what went on here. There's a tremendous history to this, but having the Hospital International Group here is, is just a, a treasure to our neighborhood. And they let us do our monthly meetings here. Um, so uh, we really appreciate uh, being here. And just a little bit of musical history. There were these two sisters that um, wrote a song about 100 years ago. One of them lived in the neighborhood on Claremont Avenue and actually uh, taught at a teacher's college. And she and her sister wrote what's thought to be the most popular song of all time. And I'd like to use that song. In fact, I'll start singing for us to wish for us, us, us to wish Gwyn Armstrong happy birthday. Happy birthday to Gwyn. Happy birthday to Gwyn. Happy birthday, dear. so much. So much of this happens because of, uh, of when. Um, so, let's, uh, let's check a few other things before we get started. I want to check my notes so I don't leave out anything. Um, this set Sunday at 2 o'clock, we have our monthly neighborhood walking tour that begins from the southeast corner of 96th Street and Broadway at 2 o'clock. Sunday. We do that every month under the auspices of our Bloomingdale Neighborhood History Group and the Columbus Amsterdam Business Improvement District. Um, you might have seen a donation uh, basket in the back. We appreciate any kind of token donation. We're a very, very small institution. Um, we have no overhead. We're, we're not recognized by the IRS. Um, you, you, Maybe you've heard, too big to fail, like too small to be detected. <laughs> so, um, and one other thing, is there anybody here because they've heard about us from Justin Ferrate? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, Justin is a real champion of history and he's a great friend of our Bloomingdale Neighborhood History Group. If you don't know about Justin, all you have to do is send him an email. Just Google him or you can go on one of his tours and he'll send you incredibly interesting historic information about tours and various other sources. He's, he's probably the best source of historical information in the entire city. We also want to acknowledge the Morningside Heights Historic District Committee, which gave our organization, the Bloomingdale Neighborhood History Group, uh, their annual award just about two weeks ago. And we we're really honored to get that, and we treasure our relationship with them. And we applaud their effort to um, become a historic uh, district. We have a few future presentations planned in May. I don't think we have a date yet, but Charles McKinney, who is the um, urban uh, designer for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, will be with us We're in the process of uh, pinning down the date and, and doing all that. On Monday, April 4th, we have uh, Thomas Mellons. He's the co-curator of the exhibit that just closed at the Museum of the City of New York on affordable housing. He's also a co-author of a number of the Robin A. M. Stern uh, books that uh, go into great detail on New York City architecture. The books are, are labeled um, 1880, 1900, 1930, and 1960. And then, on March 7th, We have Margaret Oppenheimer. And Margaret is with us here tonight. Margaret, can you stand up for a second? Yes, hey. Margaret, over here. Absolutely. Margaret's new book on Madame Eliza Jamel is absolutely spectacular. I couldn't put it down. I have pretty high standards when it comes to history. This was a, an A plus book. So Margaret will be talking about that and she'll have copies of the books here as well. So, um, let's see. Um, I think we're ready to go. I think um, 
save questions till the very end, if you don't mind. Um, it'll just be more efficient as we run through some stuff. So, bear with me. I'm going to do a few challenges here. <laughs> raise your hand. Don't yell out, but raise your hand if you think you know what all of these names have in common. <laughs> yes, sir. Say again. Misspellings. <laughs> which, which, which one is misspelled? <laughs> this is becoming an unruly crowd. <laughs> you're, you're, you're right on target. They're all misspelled. <laughs> and I, I do that in large part because I'm a very, very bad speller, and yet, and yet I know how important spelling is. So, but thanks for pointing that out. Selden Strauss. The Selden comes from John Selden. In the early 1600s in England, there was a, uh, a Jewish uh, jurist and historian uh, of renown. And, and so that's where Percy takes his second name from. Uh, I first came up on Percy when I started lecturing about the World's Fair of 1939 and 40. Uh, there are about 100 World's Fairs before that one. But the World's Fair in 1939 and 40 was, was uh, renowned for a number of reasons. And Percy Selden Strauss was right at the heart of things. He was on the board of directors of Yeah. Well, first of all, Percy Selden 
Gordon Strauss is not the only Strauss member that has been on the cover of a major magazine. Um, Macy's Jack Strauss uh, was very prominent and important in New York City when he ran Macy's, and he was also on the board of the trustees at St. Luke's Hospital in our neighborhood, and he was chairman of the board of Roosevelt Hospital. Just to give a little bit of context, I know Joan gave us wonderful detail on, on all of this, but here's the uh, patriarch of the family, Lazarus Strauss, and the four children, one of whom was a, a woman, and Isidore Strauss, and Ida, whose, whose namesake uh, gives us the park. Um, these are their seven children, and you can see the second one didn't survive infancy. So this leads me up to the next challenge. What do these people have in common? And again, if you think you know, raise your hand. Joel? Angela? I'm looking at people that are more intelligent than the average person. Gil, Gil, Gil Tower. Gil is on NPR all the time. He has a website that you know tells you about the history of every street in New York City in the past, and now he's done all the honorific names. He's arguably the third smartest guy in the room. Um, incidentally, right behind Gail is the second smartest guy in the room, Gary Dennis. Gary, most of us remember affectionately from the movie place when Gary showed us all of the knowledge he had, not only about movie history, but if you get to know Gary, he knows the city history in great, great depth. But nobody knows what these people have in common? They changed their names, Marjorie said. Nice try, Marjorie. All right, here's the real answer. They all lived at one time with Strauss Hall and Harvard. So, Strauss Hall was dedicated uh, to the parents, Ida and Isidore Strauss, by the three sons, Herbert, Jesse Isidore, and Percy Strauss. Percy Strauss, we just spoke about with his uh, connection with the New York World's Fair of 39 and 40. Herbert, on the left side, ran the second largest department store in the metropolitan area. The largest, of course, was Macy's. The second largest, which has a long, illustrious history, was Bamberger's. Macy's acquired Bamberger's in 1929, and they were very, very happy to have sold it to the Strauss family. When I say they, I'm talking about Louis Bamberger and his uh, sister, Caroline uh, Bamberger Bloom. They wanted to retire from the retailing business, the department store business, and they parlayed their, their um, philanthrop philanthropy efforts into the Institute for Advanced Studies down in Princeton. And of course, that's, that's the place that housed Alan Turing, as well as Albert Einstein, and many, many other famous people. Um, so that's part of Herbert's claim to fame. He was also a very renowned uh, Musician, he was part of a string quartet. He owned a Stradivarius. Um, he also selected one of my favorite architects from Philadelphia, Horace Trumbauer, to design his house. Uh, the building's still there, 9 East 71st Street. Some people thought that was the largest residence in New York City at the time. He never got to live in it, but um, uh, over time, the Archdiocese of New York actually purchased it and commandeered it as an annex to St. Clair's Hospital. And then years later, Leslie Wexner, who found the limited, um, uh, purchased it. And he also, for, for different reasons, did, didn't live there. Um, so you can see what an incredibly renowned uh, legacy there is with, uh, with Herbert. Jesse uh, Isidore was a confidant of FDR. He actually ran a lot of his political operations, even in New York State, but certainly nationally. And uh, he was appointed ambassador to France. He uh, actually died in office. Um, and he had a school, this is gonna be a theme for the evening, he had a school named after him, not too far from here, down on West 70th Street. The Jesse Isidore Strauss School is actually an architectural masterpiece because it was done by Edward Durrell Stone. Edward Durrell Stone did um, so many things. Uh, quickly, what comes to mind is the State University at Albany, um, the GM building, 59th and 5th. Uh, 
He's thought to have been the, the primary driver working under Wallace K. Harrison when they designed uh, Rockefeller Center. Um, uh, Edward Durrell Stern is thought to be the guy that did Radio City Music Hall. So uh, I don't think it's by accident that they've selected a very important architect to acknowledge uh, the great Jesse Isidore Strauss. Let's try this. Anybody recognize these books? Like, um, all the way on the far right, On Fire of Vanities by Tom Wolfe, or Down Below the Fixer by Bernard Nellema, or Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, uh, Cunningham's The Hours. One of these books was written by a person who wound up living in a building that sits on the site of the house of Ida and Isidore Strauss. Marjorie, you know? That's right, Madeline Langle, A Wrinkle in Time. She passed away in 2007. But, but why do I show you all these books? Because this just gives you a little bit of a sense as to the number of authors that were not only Pulitzer Prize winners, but also Nobel Prize winners that happen to be part of Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Roger Strauss partnered with a guy named John Farrar back in 1946. And um, they put together an incredible array of, um, of publishing talent. How about this? I'm toying a little bit with some rock history here. If you remember the WMCA good guys, you may or may not know that also people like Scott Muni and Murray McKay, Murray McKay Kaufman, actually were part of WMCA. But let's, uh, let's go way back. 1925, this radio station got started. In fact, MCA stands for McAlpin Hotel. This broadcast from the McAlpin Hotel, which some of you may know is still on the southeast corner of 34th and uh, Broadway. And uh, the Strauss family uh, purchased an uh, interest in it in 1943. And uh, might recognize Mick Jagger on the right there. And R. Peter Strauss wound up running this for years and years and years. And indeed, it became an incredible radio station. It's thought to be the first one where editorials were read over the air. They actually took positions. They endorsed JFK for president. They advocated for Nixon's impeachment. They supported abortion rights and the right to sell conscious, right to have contraceptives on the radio. And uh, as I said, they read uh, important editorials. They were in effect the predecessor to NPR. They even took a case uh, and brought it all the way up to the Supreme Court with some other parties. They thought rural areas were having too much uh, say in the governance of the country. And by the time it got to the Supreme Court in 1964, the Supreme Court ruled on the famous, um, you know, one vote, one man rule. So, uh, very important radio station. All right, now we get tough. I'm, I'm sorry uh, to throw this at you. Does anybody know what these people have in common? Gil? I put, keep putting Gil on the spot. All right, I'll give, I'll give you some more clues. Ready for the next clue? Same names, but I'm going to add some. The guy on the top lived in the master's apartment building in the last part of his life. Nobody? Am I the only person that stays up late at night reading stuff about this? <laughs> Gary, want to take an educated guess? With Aaron Burr? Nicholas Rourke. Nicholas Rourke. Well, you're getting warm. Getting warm. Uh, here's the final clue. See if you can piece this together. These are our Congress people going back in time. Isidore Strauss at the bottom actually came into Congress by a special election. The guy before him, Ashfeld Fitch, Ashfeld Pete Fitch, decided to leave Congress and become controller of the New, uh, in New York City. I think, I think he thought there was more money in that position. And uh, 
The governor at the time, Roswell Flower, called a special election and then elected Isidore Strauss, who kind of took it with the understanding that he really didn't want to be in politics for the long term. Um, but after him, you could work your way all the way up to Jerry Nadler. And this, this was not as uh, straightforward to put together because there was a lot of redistricting in between and there's actually some very, very minor gaps. When William Fitz Ryan passed away in September of 1972, they didn't have a special election for a while. Um, and, and in fact, his wife, Patricia Ryan, wanted to uh, fill uh, the office, but uh, she didn't get elected. That one absolutely did. So. But this really brings us around to our featured uh, people of the evening. That's Isidore Strauss and his wife, Ida, a very distinguished couple. And most people know them because of that tragic accident in 1912. And I can tell you, on April 14th, and of course April 14th, holy coincidental, is, is the day Lincoln was assassinated. But on April 12th, 1912, Percy Selden Strauss, the gentleman I associate with the World's Fair, uh, was actually staying in Ida and Isidore Strauss's house. Um, and one of his brothers was actually on a ship going to Europe. And one of the highlights of their journey, because it was meant to be a vacation, was to see some passing icebergs. Well, lo and behold, late at night on April 14th, uh, the iceberg, the, the Titanic hit the iceberg, and within three hours, uh, the ship went down. So this is usually what we remember them with. I, I'm hoping that as we go through tonight, we'll see there's a lot more about Isidore and Ida Strauss. Um, I was talking with Gary Dennis in the back before that we, we know of at least uh, six, but there might be as much as eight movies that were made about the Titanic disaster. And more than 75% of them feature Ida and Isidore Strauss because of the power of that story of her refusing to get on the lifeboat and she stayed with him. Um, there was a musical, if you ever get a chance, YouTube, the one song that's sung, sung by the characters and made in the show, it's, it's actually quite touching. And the, the um, employees at Macy's um, had a plaque made uh, ready the next year to um, give a testimonial to Ida and Isidore Strauss. And, th and this plaque was uh, kind of lost or covered for years and years and years, and only recently, thanks to the uh, Strauss Family Historical Society, did this come back into some uh, prominence right at Macy's. Uh, a school was named after Ida and Isidore Strauss. It doesn't exist anymore, but it's down in uh, Brownsville, Brooklyn. It got replaced by three housing projects on the same corner. Um, and in recent times, the school was named after them over on the east side, 3rd Avenue by 96th Street. More interesting, there were so many things that uh, paid homage to them that I really had to pick and choose, but one of my favorite ones was this. There's some people here that walk with me every Wednesday, Wednesday walkers, raise your hand. There's a bunch of us that, that do offbeat walks every Wednesday. And you guys might remember this building. This is up in the Longwood section of the Bronx. Um, it's actually, you can see from my notation there, at the intersection of Macy Place and Hewitt Place, the Hewitt is Abram Hewitt, who was the New York City mayor and son-in-law of Peter Cooper. And the Macy place is not Roland Hussey Macy, but his cousin, Josiah Macy, who happened to have some land in the area, so they named it after that. But if you walked up to this little synagogue, you would get a sense of a typical old Jewish neighborhood in the Bronx. It's, the demographics have changed dramatically today. Uh, but the building's still in pretty good shape. I know that because I went into it on Sunday. What I was hoping to find was the window that got dedicated to Ida and Isidore Strauss, but it's not there. Or if it's there, it's, it's, it's in a closet somewhere. But I spoke to all of the people that might have been able to direct me to it. We, we didn't find it. At that simple ceremony where they dedicated that, um, Isidore's sister, Hermione Strauss Combs, was there. Uh, uh, I think Nathan's, not Nathan, um, his other brother, Jesse, was there. Um, 
Irving Lehman, who was the state Supreme Court Chief Justice and brother of future Governor Herbert Lehman was there, and another fellow who lived in our neighborhood, and I'm doing more research on him, he lived in Stanley Court, which is the building and West End Avenue. His name was Ed Lauterbach. You, you won't recognize that name, but Ed Lauterbach uh, is responsible for putting up a lot of the elevated trains in Brooklyn and trolleys all over the city, especially on Amsterdam Avenue, because he got into a tizzy with St. Michael's Church about uh, the noise of the trolleys going by the church. Um, he can also get a large amount of credit after the blizzard of 1888. Lauderbach, who again lived in our neighborhood, right at 106th and Western Avenue, was the champion of putting telegraph wires and electric cable underground. In other words, spending more money to put it out of harm's way. So he was uh, quite a person. And he was chairman of the trustees of the City College of New York and many, many, many other things. But of course, the topic tonight for us is Strauss Park. So we'll try to concentrate on that uh, from now on. <coughs> we, we have uh, what I think is the greatest piece of sculpture in the entire city. Um, it is an absolutely exquisite piece. And yet I can tell you that we are not going to talk about this tonight. <laughs> it is just too big of a topic. This has all sorts of fascinating history with not just the Strauss family, but the neighborhood, the uh, sculpture, and even the architect there. That, that's an incredible story that I once Tracy. So I'm going to save that for another time. I promise you we'll do a separate presentation on that. Um, I was talking to someone recently, and she was good enough to um, send me some new information that I had not seen before about people that model for sculptures like this. And um, it reminded me, I saw Valerie Thaler come in. Valerie? Valerie is off in the corner. Valerie did a, a, a talk here about four years ago on the Joan of Arc statue, which was just incredible. It, it really inspired me at the time to start thinking about many additional uh, presentations. And um, Valerie, there's another woman in the audience here who has actually portrayed Joan of Arc as part of an exhibit um, piece where the question is being raised, why aren't there more memorials to women in New York City? Now, for many years, we used to joke that there was only Gertrude Stein and, and Bryant Park of course, Eleanor Roosevelt only appeared about 15 years ago. Um, there's the so-called, uh, uh, what's the angel in the middle of the fountain in Central Park. And you'd be hard-pressed to find many, many other sculptures or statues to, to women. Um, but there's a, a, a person in the audience I want you to all meet because she's not only portrayed Joan of Arc, but she's portrayed a number of other historical characters She's a performance artist, and she's my new favorite performance artist. Lulu, please stand up. <laughs> Lulu, yeah. If, you, should, you should Google Lulu, or you should YouTube Lulu, or you should meet her today. She is such an incredible person, and her father was very, very renowned with a lot of East Harlem history, personal friends with Vito Antonio and all sorts of other fabulous uh, people. L Lulu is a uh, phenomenon, it really it's just incredible. I'm so glad to have met her, thanks to uh, my mutual friend, uh, Joanna Herman. So, we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna touch upon um, the statue memory here, but I wanna leave you with that idea that we're gonna do a future presentation and I need to whet your appetite but I need, before I go to the next set of images here, I need to ask, anybody here have a problem with mild nudity? <laughs> mild nudity? Greg, you, you okay with nudity? Okay. Steve? Steve Cap? Steve Friedman, you're? He's on, he, says, he says he's okay with mild nudity, but not. Oh no, he has a problem with mild nudity. He, he wants to pull loose. How about you? You okay with mild nudity? Okay. I'm joking a little bit, but I'm going to show you the woman who will talk about down here when we do the sculptures in our area, who's the model, the actual representation for a lot of famous 
statues, not only in our area, we can spend a whole night on that, but all over the city. And that's the great Audrey Munson. She's thought to be the model for all of these. There's a little bit of question about whether uh, another silent film star might have modeled for um, Daniel Chester French on the monitor. But um, uh, if you look at the high cheekbones and a couple other things, it's probably Audrey Munson. Um, incidentally, the Fireman's Memorial on the lower right side, the chairman of the committee that made that happen was Isidore Strauss. The very idea for it came from the uh, uh, Bishop Henry Cotton Potter, his reaction to a horrible fire down on Canal Street, but Strauss is the man who put a committee together. In those days, and even including um, the Statue of Memory, those were all privately funded. In fact, after uh, they dedicated the park, um, the committee that, uh, that funded the Statue of Memory gave it over to New York City. To this day, New York City owns it, and the Parks Department are the, are the uh, custodians of it. So, But we usually associate the Strausses with Abraham and Strauss. Uh, so here's some images from the early days. It started out in 1865, a great retailer in Brooklyn, Joseph Wexler. Um, he um, partnered with uh, Abraham Abraham. In, in fact, Percy Selden Strauss married Abraham Abraham's daughter, Edith Abraham. Uh, and then, of course, all that gets parlayed into Macy's. They actually operate in Macy's as a department, and they do it so well that they're able to, in effect, do a leverage purchase over a period of time. Um, I show you this in, in part because we go backwards in time. Um, but a couple of, I'll digress for a second. There's a plaque on the side of Macy's that speaks to Thomas Edison and the showing of what's thought to be the first um, moving image uh, for public use in the city. Uh, you can see that on the north side of 34th Street there. So there's an Edison piece of history there. And then up in that tall building in the background, that's the New York Hotel, that's where Nicholas Telsa died. Uh, Nick Nicholas Telsa. Tesla, Tesla. <laughs> And we may be looking at his room because it was up on the 33rd floor. And then further down, just past the uh, New York Hotel, we can't see it, but was Hammerstein's. You, you might go there today for a rock concert, if anybody goes to rock concerts. And the great Oscar Hammerstein, the great impresario, who was the grandfather of Oscar Hammerstein and Rogers and Hammerstein, he lived at 949 West End Avenue for a while. And one of my great speculations of all time, and that's all it is, is a, is a speculation. We're going to have to research this, Gary. The Olympia Theater that got taken down in 2003, the name Olympia is the same name as one of Oscar Hammerstein I, one of his great theaters on Broadway, about 45th Street or so. So did they name that in homage to Oscar Hammerstein? Who knows? That's what we have to research. But I show you Macy's here also because um, Macy's is, in my estimation, the largest store in the world. I've been in Harrods in London. This is larger. And it's larger mainly because of the addition on the back. So when I show you the original Macy's, you can see it without the addition. The one on the back was actually done by the great architect uh, Robert Cohn, who did a number of buildings of the city, like the Ethical Culture Society, um, the Temple Emmanuel, uh, the River Mansion on 106th and Riverside Drive was done by Robin Cohen. Um, but let's go back even further. Here's Macy's when it was down on 14th Street. They ran out of space down here. The store became so, so, so popular. The Strausses really knew how to make shopping fun. It became so popular that they needed to buy that land further up and the timing was perfect because a few years later, Penn Station would get built and so many other things that would, that would move uptown and make it prominent. But I want to call your attention to that thin building on the left side with the flag on the top. That building is still in place. So is the larger building. But that thin building on the left side, this is it looking at it directly from 14th Street. 
It's number 56, West 14th Street. So it's between 5th and 6th on the south side. Just above the cars down at the bottom, and just to the right of the word Hughes, is a little vestige of a sign that says Macy's. And let me try to convince you. Can anybody see the word Macy's there? I'll zoom in even more, because I, I had a problem with this. I've had laser surgery. You can definitely see the star. If you start on the left, you'll see the star. There's an M. The A is a little bit faint. It's part of the C. That's still there. Next time you're down there, impress your friends with a view of Macy's. Oh, Nathan Strauss. Jim Wunsch. Where's Jim Wunsch? Professor Jim Wunsch. Jim Wunsch, stand up for a second. I know at your age it's tough. <laughs> Jim, Jim Wunsch, who's, who's my, uh, my mentor when it comes to New York City history, but he goes deeper into history than I usually do. He raised a provocative, you can sit down now, Jim. <laughs> Jim, do you need any coffee or anything? Jim, uh, Jim raised a provocative question a few years ago. He said, who's the most important person in New York City history? And we thought, well, LaGuardia, maybe Dewey Clinton, I think Ethan Allen's in the Hamilton got a few votes. Robert Moses. I know you, you pushed for the Ed Koch. Um, but you also, Jim Munch also threw out the name Nathan Strauss. So I said, oh, I'm going to show a Nathan Strauss. I went home and I did some reading, and boy, I found out everything about Nathan Strauss that makes him important. Most famously, and I show an image here, and the, maybe the heart of Jim's argument at the time was, by introducing pasteurization, and I see Caitlin Hawk just walked in. <laughs> hey, Caitlin. Caitlin gives wise counsel to our Bloomingdale Neighborhood History Group. Um, Nathan Strauss introduced the uh, pasteurization to the city, mostly for kids. So even though this is much later, you can see babies are getting free pasteurized milk. This just happens to be a Columbus circle, but they were all over the city. And that's what uh, Nathan Strauss did. He's also intricately involved, I just don't have enough time to talk about it, with establishing and creating the first parks in the city. You know, the first park in the city is officially a sewer park down on the Lower East Side. But it was a real chore to even make that happen. And Nathan Strauss, a lot of people like Lillian Wald and Jacob Schiff, they, they really made it happen. I mean, it's just incredible. He also came up with a really radical idea. I, mean, I don't think he would be able to even uh, posture this idea today. He, he thought, what if we let kids use the library? <laughs> and that's why some of you may remember, if you've ever gone into the old Donnell Library, which is getting refurbished or rebuilt as part of a, a new building, there was a Nathan Strauss picture there, and there was a Nathan Strauss room, because he really championed the uh, children's use of, uh, of libraries. He could have been mayor if he wanted to be. Chamonix Hall at the time really wanted someone not only of his stature but his integrity. And uh, for reasons we'll never know, he was, he was, he was a brash person. <laughs> so maybe he realized that um, he would uh, drive the city crazy, but he decided not to run for him. He undoubtedly would have become uh, the first Jewish mayor in the city. His brother Oscar Solomon Strauss was even more renowned. He was the first Jewish cabinet secretary. He was secretary of commerce and labor under Teddy Roosevelt. And um, my wife and I were just down there two weeks ago. We went to the memorial. The memorial is only a few hundred feet from the White House. Uh, they had to move it when they built the new Ronald Reagan building, but they put it in storage because they knew that they were going to rebuild it. It's, it's such a, a, a treasure piece, and, and Oscar Strauss is so important. When Teddy Roosevelt ran on the Bull, on the Progressive Party, we call it the Bull Moose Party, but officially it was the Progressive Party, um, against Taft and against Wilson, he in effect got Wilson elected by splitting the Republican vote. When Teddy Roosevelt ran on the Progressive ticket, Oscar Strauss ran on the Progressive ticket for governor the same year, but he didn't get elected. Very, very important, uh, another Strauss. Um, so now I want to take you uptown, because I want to show you where the Strausses lived before they moved down to 105th Street. Everybody knows um, up in the uh, Inwood area, you know, Inwood Hill Park, 
Michael, you know it, right? Michael Susie's with us. Michael's got a couple of presentations for us. His two books, one is on the Upper West Side, Postcard Views, the other's on Morningside Heights and, um, and Columbia University on, on classics. Um, so, Michael, you're a little familiar with this territory. Just give you a slightly more colorful view. There's Inwood Hill Park. And I'm going to go to an earlier map. We'll, we'll touch upon one or two. Thanks to the wonderful uh, facilities we have here, we can do this with a map. Here's a map from 1932. I've actually inserted the famous Indian caves on the lower right hand corner. Uh, school classes are going to the Indian caves all the time because it's a perfect way to talk about the Lene Lenape Indians. And this immediate area was thought to be, but there's really no substantiation for it, where Peter Minuet supposedly paid the 60 guilders for Manhattan. But anyhow, on that map, as late as 1932, you can see the name Strauss, where uh, my arrow points. Here's another map that just kind of does the same thing. Now, I show you this because uh, out of, obviously, idle curiosity, uh, my wife and I go up there trying to find remnants of the house. And there are. There are bricks on the ground. They're not easy to come by. Some of them are like partially underground, but they're there. And, and there are other buildings here too. So anytime anybody wants to go up there with me, you know, bring the hiking shoes and the shovel, we'll take a look. Uh, this is what it looked like. And Margaret Oppenheimer, Margaret, do you recognize the name Bolton? Oh, you're good, Margaret. Margaret says, wasn't there a book written by a guy named Moulton in the 1890s? Absolutely. The Definitive History of Washington Heights by Reginald Pelham Moulton. He comes from this family which settled up there. And he also, if, if you go to the Dykeman House, behind the Dykeman House, there's a number of these long huts. That was one of Moulton's favorite things. He actually recreated Lene Lenape huts to prove or to, show or to calculate the population of the Lene Lenape that lived on the island of Manhattan. So if you haven't had that experience, you should go up there. And Moulton with another guy whose name escapes me for the moment, uh, those are the guys that led the field expedition in northern Manhattan to find Revolutionary War remnants. They, they kind of, uh, going to be too pejorative now, but they panicked with so many apartment buildings going up that they organized serious field trips, go up there, dig up stuff before they would be lost forever. And they're on display in both the New York Historical Society and the American Museum of Natural History. But that's the name Moulton. But Gary, I keep pointing back to you. Do you, do you, re do you recognize the name Guy Bolton? Yeah. Guy Bolton is the son of Reginald Pelham Bolton, which is what Margaret brought up. Guy Bolton wrote the book for a number of uh, drunk musicals, as well as uh, Gershwin's Girl Crazy. Uh, he even rewrote the book for Oscar Strauss's Chocolate Soldier. Oscar Strauss is the operetta composer, and he's uh, second cousin once removed from the Oscar Strauss that we featured here. And I also want to feature Oscar Strauss III is in the last row here, joining us as are a number of people. His hand just went up, a fabulous guy. Yeah. So isn't it incredible that we have um, Strauss members uh, with us tonight, people from Strauss uh, Family Historical Society. So that's the bold story. I apologize for digressing. Here's a view from above, which shows, um, you can see they misspelled Isidore supposed to be spelled with an I. And I've also got an arrow pointed to another name, Jefferson Levy. Anybody recognize that name? I apologize for this obscurity. <laughs> Jefferson Levy? Jefferson Macro Levy? Yes, Gil, Gil got it. Monticello he connects him with. His uncle, Uriah Levy, purchased Monticello in the 1830s, saved it, restored it, preserved it, and then it passed on to other parties. And in fact, Jefferson Levy, his uh, nephew, uh, was custodian for a while, and then became a member of the House of, um, uh, of the 
U.S. Of Congress. So he knew Isidore Strauss, they knew each other as neighbors, but they also would have known each other through governmental circles. Their, their time in Congress didn't overlap. Right? And Jefferson Levy, or I see a picture of him, and there's my cello, and of course it's on the back of the river. So another digression, I apologize. But finally, they decide to move down to West 105th Street. The story goes that it was just too far uptown for Isidore Strauss to conduct his family business. Um, at that point, we're in 1884. Uh, up to that point in time, he's still doing stuff in Brooklyn, but they've, they've got a presence in Macy's, and it's just too difficult. There's, there's a slightly more melodramatic story that uh, young Jesse had to rush off on a horse after his brother got butted by a, by a goat as a little kid and was unconscious for a short while. So maybe that also prompted them to leave Inwood and come down to 105th Street and Broadway. We have precious few pictures of the house on Broadway or 105th Street, but here's one of them. Um, give you a little bit of map perspective here from uh, 1885. And when they when they moved into the house, I think in July of 84, 1884, they're in the same year that Dakota got built, which is a simplistic start of development for Upper, upper West Side real estate. And the same year this building got built, the building we're in here. This is, uh, we were talking a little bit uh, before, Toby, remember? This is the Association for Aged and Indigent Fe for respectable aged and indigent females. And this building is a landmark building by Richard Morris Hunt was built in 1884, same year that the Strauss moved to, to this location. So you can see there's two buildings on the property. There's the main house, um, and then there's the, kind of the barn in, in the back where they probably kept um, um, a horse or two and a carriage because um, Isidore Strauss would travel downtown by getting on the 9th Avenue L, and he would get off at 81st Street. The story was that from 81st Street, he could see the couple of his house, but the chauffeur would come by a horse and, and carriage would have come and picked him up at the 81st Street and 9th Avenue uh, station. Let's, uh, let's try to get a, a different time perspective on this. Um, all right, here I am just kind of backing out a little bit so you can see what's, what's around it, including the building we're in. Woodlawn. 
So here's, here's the house the Strauss is in. It says M.T. Brennan. M.T. Brennan stands for Matthew Brennan. He was a crony of Ross Tweed. Um, and then he was a county sheriff for a while. He actually, I mean, try, try to make sense out of this. He actually arrested Boss Tweed, <laughs> and then separately, he got put into prison for about a month. Um, and then after he got out of prison, he came back and lived in this house for a little bit, and then died in virtual poverty around 1879. Is a picture of him. Here's a famous um, cartoon by the great Thomas Nast, who is usually more known for creating the uh, donkey and the elephant images for the Democratic Republican parties, as well as the, the modern conception, the cartoon conception of Santa Claus. And I'd like to take us back even further, if you bear with me for a little bit. This is the Randall Maps, Colonel John Randall. He did these maps in. 1818 to 1820. Up here is the Bloomingdale Insane Asylum. So that's up around 117th Street. Over here, well, this is the Bloomingdale Road, right? Up here is the turn in the Bloomingdale Road. That's where uh, Riverside Drive today becomes, goes up to Claremont Avenue. It kind of turned abruptly right there at about 16th Street. Um, and down here, the Bloomingdale Road appears a little bit westerly, is about 103rd Street, I would say. But I'll zoom in, I'll make it a little bit easier. So, here we are, you can see 106th Street, 105th Street. That house, Brennan's house, and later on the Straps house, is, is not at all on this property. Um, this building here that I pointed out before, um, Woodlawn, that's the house of uh, William and Sarah Haywood. They, they weren't prominent or anything, but um, Anthony Trump's mother, Mrs. Trump, stayed there actually and, and wrote some very favorable things about it and about staying on the Upper West Side back in the 1830s and, and 40s. But I want to call your attention to what would become Strauss Park, which is right here. So let's zoom in on that. Oh, wait. This is at the corner of 106th Street, named West End Avenue over time. The MON stands for Monument. And when it happened, when Colonel John Randall actually uh, scoped out the city, surveyed the city to create the grid work that we know today, and all of this has been recounted at the Museum of the City of New York. And we have the curator actually to present here on, on much of this. But when Randall did that, at the southwest corner of every future block, he put either a monument, and there were 1,549 of them, or if, there was, if the ground wasn't soft enough to put a monument in, he put in an iron bolt, and there were 98 iron bolts through Manhattan. And this is what they look like. That's the monument to the right. It's about three feet, nine inches tall. Only the top part would be above ground. And there is a Randall bolt on the left side. You can see a Randall bolt if you walk into Central Park, and you can see they used the bolt because um, it, it's in a rock outcropping. But if you walk into Central Park at 65th Street and about 6th Avenue, try to imagine where they intersect, and you'll see that bolt. That's the only publicly known bolt, Randall Bolt. Oh. So, quickly back to Strauss Park. Notice uh, there's a building here, the Trueville, that says facing Skylar Square. I'll give you another image of that. That's that, um, on the left side, that's the bar that's still there today. I forget the name of it, Tower Hill, I believe. And here's another view of it. So this is the corner of 100th Street and Broadway. 
And that true bill comes down and gets replaced by absolute bagels. <laughs> and why do I call your attention to that? Because when they advertised for that building, they cited the fact that they were on Skylar Square. So I'll show you that on the map there. And that was named after Charles Edward Skyler. He was connected uh, through marriage with Alexander Hamilton. He comes from the great Skyler family um, uh, and connected with so many other prominent uh, families um, in New York City history. Um, he was a real estate developer, uh, and his, his name goes there. Um, but then the name Skylar Square is going to change because this is a church building that is just an image on Broadway 68th Street that got built around 1814, I believe. And this got replaced by a larger building in 1885, Bloomingdale Dutch Reformed Church. And right away you can see the name Bloomingdale. And that was on Broadway 68th Street. That moved uptown to 949, where 949 West End Avenue is today. Here, here's an image of it. I'll, I'll show you two more images. That's looking through the bottom part of the park. And here's a wider view. That church lasted all about eight or nine years. And then the congregation kind of dissipated, and they replaced it with the apartment building that's there today. One curiosity, which requires some research, is I happen to know that in the church building there were two John Lafarge windows. What happened to those? So I have to figure that out. So, let's go back in time. This will get us closer to kind of wrapping up here. I, I highlighted 949 West End Avenue as an apartment building. We're in 1916. Strauss Park is already named there. Let's go to 1911. The Strauss House down at the bottom, that yellow structure, is there in 1911. It's still called Skyla Square on the map. That's probably wrong. It does say Bloomingdale Reform Church, where 949 Western Avenue is. So let's go back a little further. 1899, you can see the Strauss House down there at the bottom. 1897, is the Strauss House on the left side. 1891, we see the Strauss House with the barn, so we can kind of impute that the barn came down in the next few years. And this just zooms in a little bit. I apologize for these maps. So, um, after the Strausses uh, went down on the Titanic, there was a groundswell effort to rename the park from Bloomingdale Square. I forgot to mention that they renamed the park Bloomingdale Square when the Bloomingdale Dutch Reformed Church came up there. Um, but there was a groundswell effort after the Strausses passed away to rename the park Strauss Park. And a committee was put together and it had all sorts of prominent people. It even got money from Booker T. Washington and it was just inevitable. Finally, the uh, alderman um, in, in the neighborhood fell by the name of uh, Brush introduced a uh, resolution. It got overwhelmingly approved, signed by Mayor William Gaynor, um, and they're all set to name it Strauss Park, except for this fellow, Hopper Stryker Mott. He wrote a letter to Jacob Schiff, who was chairman of the committee, and he said, well, I hope that you call it Strauss Park, but I'd like to think that we can still call the square, Bloomingdale Square, because it will be the last vestige of the name Bloomingdale um, on maps and in, in, a, in a public sense. Um, and they kind of rejected that. So, Hopper Streichermach comes from one of these very old Dutch families. He's re related to Edward Hopper, the artist, Stryker, Stryker's Bay, Stryker Historical Society. And Mott, he's actually a cousin to the great Dr. Valentine Mott. Uh, his uncle was Jordan Mott, who was acting mayor who uh, became acting mayor, the only, US, the only New York City mayor that was um, that died in office, uh, Frederick William Havemeyer, died prematurely, and Jordan Mott, Mott Haven in the Bronx, comes after his name. So, but a lot of things happened after the uh, uh, Titanic disaster. 
Um, there are all sorts of memorials, gatherings, schools, churches, synagogues, all sorts of places, even outside of New York City, are commemorating the Strausses. This just shows one headline where Carnegie Hall couldn't even hold the crowds. Uh, and Andrew Carnegie himself spoke of that, as did Mayor Gaynor, as did Julia Richmond, who were dying two weeks later, two months later, rather. And they decided, of course, to commemorate the new park uh, in 1915. Uh, this just shows the crowds gathering with the Beethoven Musical Society. Central Park cost about five million, and Riverside Park cost about eight point four million. So, and here's uh, members of the Strauss family. All six of the children are at the ceremonies here. That's that Willie the Old Dutch Reformed Church in the background. Um, and here's what the memorial looked like on that day. Um, you know, the Strauss story is so large, so big, um, and what we get out of it is this absolutely incredible park. So, so I thank you all for your attention and interest in all of our local history. Thank you. Schedule the thing. Uh, 
Um, and so at, at this dedication ceremony, they had a bunch of kids from the Educational Alliance come, and they marched up this way, those fences right there, and they put a wreath on the memorial, and then they dropped flowers in the pool in front of it. And um, you kind of get a sense of how the pool was a little bit different uh, back then. But, uh, and, and the Educational Alliance would be a whole story unto itself. That, that's where Arthur Murray learned how to dance. That's, that's where uh, Ben Shaw, Louise Mendelssohn, Rothko all painted. Um, I mean, so many things happened. Uh, Eddie Cantor had his first stage appearance at the Educational Alliance. Uh, Robert Sarnoff, who founded RCA and NBC and all that stuff, learned English at the Educational Alliance. It's part of a much wider story. And, 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 and my friend Lulu and I were talking about this a little bit. It also ties in with a lot of the early uh, settlement house history. So, uh, any other questions quickly? Yep. He is, he is also had a clever in building replace the Strauss uh, Mansion. Um, Strauss Mansion, it's, it's interesting, right after the Titanic was up, uh, disaster, they recovered the body of Isidore Strauss, they didn't recover Ida's body. And Isidore's body came into the city by train and a couple other things down from, I think, Newfoundland. It, it got off the train station at Park Avenue and 125th Street so that there wouldn't be a whole nasty crowd scene in Grand Central. And then they took it into the residence and the whole house was like surrounded by bouquets and well-wishers and whatnot, and something like 10 or 12 days later, the house got sold. And the apartment building, the developer put up the apartment building within six or eight months, the clever apartment building. Yep. Any other questions? Yep, thank you. Uh, monuments and vaults, what exactly do they indicate? Say again, sorry. Monuments and vaults, a lot of real vaults in What, what is, he's asking, what did the uh, Randall monuments and vaults indicate? When Colonel John Randall surveyed the city as part of the commission's plan to get a, a street grid for the city, he decided as a matter of convention to frame blocks, future blocks that would be built in the future by putting a monument or a vault on the southwest corner of every block. And I, I, I got a really resistant temptation to digress because it's so detailed, but as you know, like every block is 200 feet wide, for example. But at the southwest corner of every block in the city that was conceived by the Randall plan, they put a monument if they, could, if they had soft ground there, or if they had a rock outcropping and they couldn't put a monument in, a marble monument, they drilled a hole and put in an uh, iron bolt. In the back there, yep. Um, I'd like to introduce myself as the horticulturist of Friends of Strauss Park. We take care of the park. Our president is here today. Our president We took over the park and when Leon Arbach had it redone again and ded rededicated. And we've been taking care of it ever since. And we just like to welcome you all, like our members, and help support us. And takes good care of the park. I've increased the flower content. This year we planted over 3,000 bulbs. So this spring should be very beautiful. Please look forward to seeing gorgeous flowers. Well, look, we have some papers over here if you want to become a, a member of the Friends of Strauss Park. And if you don't do it today, you can, uh, of course, go online. We have a website, Friends of Strauss Park, F O S E. And we encourage you to be a member. and. We even love volunteers and people who might want to help in that. So thank you for your attention to that, and this is a fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we'll end with that. That was a perfect way to end.